especially important tonight is to actually feel grateful and good about making it through the six weeks. As I've mentioned several times, you know, one of the major tendencies of our minds these days is, you know, we have lots of good thoughts, good inclinations, but follow through is really hard. Just, I think it's especially endemic with our information systems for us to get pulled in different directions. And even though we may initially feel quite inspired about something, we don't follow through. So take the time to feel good about having followed through. And that doesn't mean you made all six weeks, but that you've stuck with it as best you can. And I'm sure if you actually did some of the practice, you know, besides the guided meditations when we come together on Tuesday night, but, you know, made your best effort to do some practice on your own, you realized how challenging <laughs> it is to be mindfully aware. So completing the six weeks, and even in my case, you know, completing 37 years of pretty dedicated practice, I feel that I'm a sincere beginner in the practice. Doesn't mean I haven't learned a thing or two, doesn't mean I haven't experienced real fruits from the practice. Just means that the what the practice delivers is quite vast. And I think even appropriate to use the word incomprehensible, what it leads to this awakening process. And so the <clears throat> gratitude is really more about having stuck with it, having sort of found something that my heart and, and hopefully yours as well, deeply values. There's something about showing up to life in this open, curious, undefended way that's deeply, deeply trustworthy. And unfortunately, really hard. It's not complicated hard. It's just hard because the habits of our mind, the habits of our heart are to be distracted and superficial and over and over again deflected away into our thoughts about things as opposed to being intimate, being open, feeling, letting the moment in in a way and letting the moment the sound, the sight, the touch, the movement of emotion, really letting it have its effect. So there's something that, <clears throat> excuse me, there's something that arises slowly, gradually in practice. So in a way, the whole path is getting more and more clear of where the path leads. So whatever you think the path is about, it's good to have a lot of humility. Like, okay, this is what I think, but I know that I don't really know. So that we're open to the sense of what it's all about, where it all leads, that that's uh, sort of an ongoing refinement. So, you know, we have words, like we say, oh yeah, I'm able to be more spacious, more equanimous, more easy, more even with the ups and downs of life. The Buddha, and I think I mentioned this in one of the earlier classes, the eight worldly winds, it's called in the tradition, gain and loss, praise and blame, fame and disrepute. See, there's two more. Gain and loss, pl uh, pleasure and pain, gain and loss, pleasure and pain, fame and disrepute, praise and blame. And that is our, that is the Buddha's description of human existence, right? Sometimes people like us, sometimes they don't. Sometimes my body feels good, give me a nice massage, I feel all light and tingly or a nice sauna and then cold shower, right? It can feel really good. And then other times, especially as we get older or sick, body doesn't feel good at all. Sometimes we're respected and sometimes people don't want to be around us. And of course, it's not this, this doesn't mean it's the same for all of us. Some of us have 
more good fortune, more privilege, others less fortune, less privilege, more oppression, that all of us are being pushed around or moved around between these eight worldly winds. So hopefully you're sensing that the practice isn't just about, or any, you know, even, you know, just generally spiritual life isn't about <clears throat> having a good, powerful, beautiful experience. It's really, in, at least in these uh, teachings from the Buddha, the point of spiritual life is to be this deepening capacity to be open, to be at ease, no matter the conditions. So instead of applying myself to have nice experience, I'm developing this capacity to be at ease, to be kind and loving, to be clear and wise, no matter the circumstance, no matter the conditions. So in this sense, we're practicing so that we can be balanced and kind when we're dying, when a good friend or loved one is dying, so we can be even and balanced and at ease when really good things are happening, when really difficult things are happening, so that the clarity and the kindness and the breadth and depth of understanding is there no matter whether it's a boring moment or a special moment. So we can really show up in our lives, whatever we do in life. So that's really good to bring to mind because then it, it actually helps us understand why we might put aside 30 minutes a day or 45 minutes a day or if we're lucky an hour a day to practice, right? So then, oh, okay, so here and the relative simplicity of this 30 minute sit I'm gonna do where I'm sitting in a comfortable way, I'm in the space in my home where it's gonna be relatively quiet, my Cell phone is off, the cat or dog is in the other room. I've got the timer so I don't have to worry about how long. You know, it's like a pretty simple, pretty ideal situation. The right time of day, not too hungry, not too full, not too sleepy, not too restless. So we find the, you know, in our, each of our particular situation, we find the best time and then what are we doing? Well, we're practicing being at ease, being intimate and at ease, this marriage of intimacy and non-attachment with the eight worldly winds, gain and loss, pleasure and pain, fame and disrepute, praise and blame. But of course, it's not, we're not interacting with other people, so it's just the storms within our own heart and mind, right? But we're remaining upright, at ease, relaxed, clearly aware, intimate, and not blown around by sensation, by sound, by thought, by memory, by emotion. But that's not the same as repressing. Now, we've created a relatively simple place like kindergarten, right? So that 30 minute sit or 45 minute sit that you've established in your life, you know, if not every day, most days, ideally. It's going back to kindergarten where I, okay, now we're in this part of my day is as simple as it can get. I'm going to practice exposing myself to the eight worldly winds, whatever moves in my body, whatever moves in the room, whatever moves in my heart, whatever moves in my mind. And I'm going to practice being intimate, seeing it, feeling it, letting it express itself, letting it touch the sensitivity of the heart, let it be known. But there's something that remains unstained, unmoved, but it isn't that unstained, unmoved, that peacefulness doesn't come from being hard or distant, like, oh, I'm over here a million miles away on the watchtower, looking at my life, looking at my body, looking at those memories that are arising from some distance. 
we want that sense of being spacious and unmoved and peaceful. That's why we want it to be right in the middle. That's why we really emphasize the intimacy and the openness and the undefendedness. So how to be right there when a thought arises, when an emotion arises, when sensation, pain in the knee arises, when a irritating sound arises. Oh yeah, sometimes it's like this. Can this be okay? That's a real question. Is it safe now in my formal training, that my 30 minutes sit, is it safe for me to remain intimate, relaxed, and not attached, like letting life rip? So whatever memory, whatever distraction, whatever sound, whatever smell, whatever scratching on the door from the dog arises, it's just something being known, being felt. I mean, short of the building burning down, we practice staying put. Oh yeah, sometimes the dog freaks out in the other room. Can that be okay? Yeah, it's probably okay for the rest of the set. Oh my, oh, did I leave my phone on? It's ringing. Oh, that's okay for me not to know what that's about. Yeah, it's okay. Because I, if I had my act together, I would have shut it off anyway. So it's okay. I, I'll deal with it when this sits over. And every time our to-do list arises, you know, it's interesting. We can avoid <clears throat> so many things for weeks on, a, on end. But somehow when it comes up in the middle of a sit, this is the time I should do this. You know, oh, and now I got to clean the bathroom. Or now I need to do this thing on my to-do list. Well, you know, we've been avoiding it for weeks. I think we can wait until we're done with the sit. So there's something about the formality of that ritual of sitting the body down in a relatively comfortable way, let the body express the interest in being intimate by being somewhat upright, but in a way that maintains the comfort, right? So whatever that looks like with your body's age and injuries and whatever, because even, you know, when there's really a lot of pain, you can even do the practice lying down because the pain will keep you alert, right? So you don't need to actually be sitting up. So let the posture somehow reflect the intention to be intimate, to see things, feel things just as they are. So we're not practicing to get to heaven. We're not practicing for some special experience, but they do come. There will be moments in the meditation, maybe some of you have experienced really deep states of calm and peace, sometimes real waves of ecstasy, or we call it rapture. The Pali word is piti, P-I-T-I, piti. And it's, it can really feel like the body mind is floating so light, so free. But remember when those nice meditative experiences come, it's something being known. Pleasure is being known, rapture, joy is being known, calm, peace is being known. And then when things are really difficult and there's tremendous sadness or grief or physical pain or energetic restlessness or whatever it might be, basically anything under the sun can and does arise, lasts for a while and then ceases and something else happens, right? It's always been that way, it always will be. But the, the ultimate goal on the practice isn't to have nice experience because however nice the experience is, it will express nature, which is things come and go, things come and go. So we can't get dependent on a nice sit, but what we can take refuge in is the wisdom, the, the real heart of wisdom knowing how to be at ease, how to be spacious, how to not be afraid, not attached, no matter the conditions that come and go. And that's why, and I might've mentioned this earlier, but when 
we talk about the knowing mind, right? Because I, you've heard me say already in these six classes, oh, it's just this being known. So that awareness, that mindful awareness that we're cultivating, the reason the Buddha relies on that isn't that it's um, somehow our salvation awareness. Awareness is just what it is. It's awareness. It's that part of the mind that illuminates experience so that it's known. But the, there's something about the uh, process of being aware that helps the heart realize the, the way to freedom, let's say. Because the, the interesting thing about awareness, and we'll, we'll do the loving kindness practice for the first 15 minutes tonight, and you'll see that too. There's something about love, there's something about mindful awareness that remains unstained no matter what the awareness knows. The awareness, like if I'm aware, like say you do something that really makes me angry, right? And let's say there's some momentum in my practice, so I'm aware, oh yeah, I'm really angry. Anger's like this. The awareness of the anger isn't angry. Right? Anger is being known. I, maybe I feel the heat in my body. Maybe I feel the constriction in my chest. Maybe I notice these impulses to want to say something back, you know, that point my finger in the person's face and say something that will really put that person in their place or whatever. But, but the, that space of awareness or that space of self compassion, some flavor of love, it can see the reactivity. It can even sense the unskillfulness of it. But the awareness, the kind, wise presence, isn't what it's seeing, what it's experiencing. So one of the reasons we really, and you see how that relates to equanimity in the face of the complexity of life, the good and the bad and the ugly, right? So by um, really being uh, highlighting and learning how to be established in that awareness, oh, this is being known, this is being known. We're really learning something about non-attachment. And that something we learn about non-attachment requires the exposure, not like, when we get into really beautiful, concentrated, calm meditation states, we have this temporary seclusion from how wild and messy, complex life is. So when they come your way, those quiet, peaceful, secluded, meditative states, totally abide in those beautiful spiritual states as long as they last. As you're maybe entering, you might just remind yourself, this is a very wholesome, healing, meditative state. And like everything else, it will come and go. But as long as it persists, of course, I'm going to relax. Of course, I'm going to appreciate. Of course, I'm going to let it have its healing effect. Why wouldn't I? Right? We don't have to, just because it's something that comes and goes, doesn't mean it isn't really healing and therapeutic spiritually, emotionally, therapeutic. It is. These deeper states of calm really are healing. But, but what we're really taking refuge in is this capacity to be intimate without being stained, without being contaminated by the wildness and the messiness of life. So we can keep showing up and responding and being a skillful human being in all the roles that we play with our friends, with our partners, with the wider world. We can be a good person. So that's probably enough to get us started. And so for the guided uh, sit tonight, I thought I would go through the formal loving kindness practice for about the first 15 minutes. Then we'll take 10 minutes or so, and we'll do what you probably are normally doing at home for the bulk of your sitting time, which is using an anchor in some way. Some of you will be, it will be appropriate at some times to be really 
dedicated to your anchor, like the feeling the breath coming in, feeling the breath going out. Other times when the mind is more settled, the anchor is there, but you can notice other phenomena coming and going. Oh, planning mind is being known. Hearing sounds are being known. And then back with the breath. So you're sort of, the breath may be in the periphery. Sometimes it's in the forefront of attention, sometimes in the periphery. And then for the last few minutes, like we've been doing, we'll go to open awareness where we're not dependent on attending to the anchor at all. And whatever phenomena, whatever, whatever experience is being known, then that's the meditation object in that moment. And that really lends itself to practice in daily life. And for that last little bit, last few minutes, you might want to practice with the eyes open. Okay, so just go ahead and stretch out and then we'll sit for about 30 minutes. Kyle has volunteered to say a few words about um, how the center operates. We'll do that before we end at nine o'clock, but there'll be time for questions uh, before that. So take your time, settle in making this wise resolve to sit in a way that's relatively comfortable and relaxed and also relatively still. See what makes sense for your body tonight. It won't be perfect, just do the best you can. And just a, as a way of collecting the mind, collecting the heart, just listening to the sound of the bell. I'll just ring it three times, do a little hearing meditation. And the sense, this beautiful and wholesome sense of meeting our own life right here. And of course, the most obvious part of our life is the physicality now of this body sitting here. Sensing the rhythm of the breath and the beating of the heart and the upright structure of the body, all the different touch points. And in a very simple, sincere way, just appreciating this vehicle of our life, this body. And the simple truth, doesn't mean the body's perfect, but the simple truth, I do care about this body. And I care enough, it's healing now just to be, to know that the heart is sensitive, is present with this body, appreciating, caring for this body, and wishing well. And you can repeat some of these phrases after I say them out loud. But just connect with the meaning of these words. May this body be safe and protected. May wisdom and love 
protect this body. And may it be happy and healthy and at ease in life. I do care about this body and care enough right now to be close, to be really open or listening, receiving the reality of the sitting body just as it is. And I care enough to wish well these simple wishes heartfelt wishes that we can repeat. May this body be safe and may wisdom and love protect this body. May it be happy and healthy and at ease in life. May this tender, aging body, fragile body, may it be safe. May wisdom and love protect this body. May it be happy and healthy and at ease in life. So just continue on your own. Of course, you can come up with your own phrase or word to repeat. Or just do it in silence, just the warmth, generous, warm, kind, holding, connecting with the body. As if you were smiling toward the body and appreciation and loving wishes. And sensing in your own way the body being touched by this simple kindness and well-wishing. And we sense the sensitive heart here, a heart that cares, a heart that feels so many different feelings and emotions, has so many different thoughts. I do care about this sensitive heart. This sensitive heart that's right at the center of this life. And I care enough now to be attentive to how the heart is right now, just to show up and be attentive, feel what's here to feel in the heart, and to smile at my own heart, and to wish well, why not? May this heart be safe, and may wisdom and love protect this heart always. 
May this heart be happy and healthy and at ease in the world. I do care about this heart. May the heart, this life be safe. May wisdom and love protect me, protect this heart. And may it be happy and healthy and at ease in life. So just continue on your own, connecting with your own heart right here, right now. Don't be shy if it helps to repeat a simple word or a phrase like I've suggested, then do that. If you don't need any phrase, then just do it in silence, just keeping this loving kindness in mind toward oneself. So we're practicing, doing our best, abiding in a very natural generosity, kindness of the heart. Caring about the body, caring about our own sensitive heart here. And this basic love has the nature to expand. So you might just feel, in a sense, it's spilling over when you care about the people in the class, you care about your pet in the other room or your partner or your friend. Almost like a beautiful warm glow that radiates out in all directions love for its own sake, but in a most, in the most simple, natural sense, this goodness of the heart, this benevolence of the heart, shining out, I will abide, pervading all the directions with this heart imbued with love, above and below, all around, everywhere, and every way I will abide, pervading the all-encompassing world with love, with kindness, abundant, beautiful, free from any ill will, I will abide. So we're learning to abide with this basic goodness, basic kindness of the heart. And if you need, then just bring to mind some of the people that remind you of this capacity to be loving in a generous sense. We'll bring some words to mind that help this confidence that this heart is good capable of well-wishing. So we'll continue for another five minutes in silence. The meditation object is the radiance of goodness, of kindness. Just as best you can, keep it going.
And you can continue with the loving kindness meditation where the theme or the meditation object is the emotion or attitude of love itself, keeping it simple. But otherwise, just transition, if you'd like, to mindfulness of breathing, breathing in, experiencing the whole body just as it is, feeling the breath going out, experiencing the whole body just as it is. And you'll see how well the quality of metta, loving kindness, just carries over into mindfulness practice. This kind presence with the physicality of the sitting body, the breathing body. And when other objects of experience arise, so-called distractions, then just be aware in a kind way. Oh yeah, this is being known now. It's just this phenomena being known, being felt. Like everything else, it arises, it will pass away on its own. So I can be aware in this clear and kind way. And we cultivate a continuity of mindful awareness as best we can. Willing to start over again and again. So we'll continue in silence for about 10 minutes.
So remember, we're learning how to be in the middle of the eight worldly winds, different experiences coming and going, pleasant and unpleasant and neutral ones. And whether we're with a particular anchor, feeling the breath or feeling the body as the breath comes in, goes out, or noticing some mental pattern, emotional feeling, sound, sight, whatever. It's just this experience being known, being felt. And if there's a not liking happening, well, that not liking is just the next thing being known or felt. So remember, it can be helpful to acknowledge what's being felt and known. Oh yeah, this is being known. It's like this now. And that can evoke that spacious, wise non-attachment with the phenomenas, the experiences that come and go. And whenever you like now, 
You can allow the eyes to open if they've been closed. And of course, we're not looking around, just sitting relatively still, relaxed. And being less dependent now on the anchor. So whatever the mind is knowing, see if you can recognize or remember this is being known. This is what the mind is knowing. You don't need, of course, that language in your mind. What we're interested in is this very simple continuity of present moment awareness. Remember, it's okay to relax. And if you notice yourself directing the attention, then notice that that's happening in the moment. This is something being known. In a way, we're learning how to abide in the totality of things here in the moment. Not picking and choosing. And in a deeper sense, not even feeling the need to do. In a sense, we're just willing to be. So we'll continue for a few more minutes. Keep it really simple, sitting here in a relaxed and alert way. We're just curious about that marriage of intimacy and non-attachment, letting things be. How to be both alert and interested and present and letting whatever's coming and going, internally, externally, just letting it be of attachment. So if we want to be free in life generally, then here in our practice, we practice being intimate and free with whatever is coming and going.
And take a little time, just the body if you need to. That was actually a little bit more than 30 minutes. And this is a good time. We'll take uh, maybe 15 minutes or so, people to share what you've been learning. And you can remember these three ways we practiced tonight. We did the more structured or formal loving kindness practice. So there are many ways to do this practice. And before I forget, I'll just mention if you want to dig in with the loving kindness practices, because there are different ways to do it. Uh, right now, in uh, this uh, COVID time, we're offering a guided loving kindness practice every Friday, 7 to 8.30 p.m. And different teachers from Common Ground lead that. Everyone's welcome. So we call it a, you know, a weekly practice group, but it's focused on compassion and loving kindness practice. And you can join in any Friday at 7. And the link for all of our programs are on our public calendar, uh, online calendar. So you might just check that out. And it's usually a guided meditation followed by a discussion in Q&A time about the love and kindness practice. So we did that for 15 minutes. Then we did our more uh, regular mindfulness practice with an anchor, most of us, where we're cultivating the continuity of present moment awareness. And then at the end, doing more of an open awareness practice where we're not directing the attention back to the primary meditation anchor, right? So we're learning to be mindful without having a mindfulness object. So that way, whatever the attention is being aware of, that's your mindfulness, that's your meditation object. That's that open awareness style that we do for the last few minutes. And of course, over time, that could be a bigger part of your practice. Where you, if your mind's already quite settled, you might not need to work with a primary meditation anchor like your breath, for more than a minute or two. And then you might be able to go right into that open awareness. As long as you're able to maintain some thread of present moment awareness, of course, we'll get distracted, but coming back relatively soon, or you might not need to use that anchor to stabilize present moment awareness. So this would be a good time just to share what you've been learning, what's been hard, what has felt like success in your practice, questions that are emerging. Feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself maybe with your first name. Anybody like to go first? What have you been learning these weeks and even in tonight's sit? What questions are coming to mind? That's a really important point. And, and uh, so that insight that uh, is really going, and this is, and we've talked about this, you know, where there's a repeated pattern, like thinking and thinking in a particular, along a particular group, how can I be helpful? How can I take care of? And then it's wisdom that gets curious. What else is here in the moment? but not being clearly felt and acknowledged. And that's what you were saying, Ruth, that underneath that habit of going back to that, oh, what should I do? How can I take care of what I was doing? You know, that sort of planning is recognizing that there's some tight controlling energy there. And then even further down, you're beginning, it sounds like you're beginning to have glimpses that, there's this deeper, more subtle um, fear of not being in control. And, and, and you'll keep kind of peeling back the layers, but beneath everything, there's something else. And beneath that, there's something else. But it all comes down to this very subtle, and, and, and generally in spiritual life, subtle is significant. And what's gross and obvious is usually just a cover for what's more subtle. And then there's often, and we should just presume 
there's something beneath whatever already seems subtle. Maybe there's something more subtle under that. But it all comes down to some wormy, subtle uneasiness of the heart. And, and uh, when we do our best to put words to it, we'll say something like a subtle, wormy anxiety, a subtle, wormy, fe- wormy fear, sense of lack, sense of longing. But there's something that's uneasy, deep and subtle in the heart. And then the question you ask, Ruth, is, well, what do we do with that? Well, we do what we do with the gross or obvious stuff, which is we recognize this is here, feels like this. And in a sense, we give it permission because it's nature. It wouldn't be showing up in our experience if, in a sense, it didn't have rights to be here. Same with that more subtle, mysterious stuff that's moving there. It really wants to be, it, it needs and wants the space of awareness to do whatever it's going to do, feel whatever way it's going to feel. And basically we're getting, we're making peace with the truth that there's nobody in control and that life is wild and ungovernable, Right? And so this is going to emerge. The more stable present moment awareness becomes, the more this subtle truth that things are uncertain, things are unreliable, they're ungovernable. It's just going to come to the surface. And it will start like exactly as you said, with some obvious thing in my life, and we start to notice that the mind is obsessing about something. But because there's enough stability in awareness, We sense what's underneath it. Oh, the mind's trying to control something. What's underneath that? Oh, the mind is afraid of not being in control. That things are uncertain. Because at this more subtle level, it's really true about everything. You know, when and I, my partner and I just heard about a friend of ours, you know, has really just found out today has really serious cancer. You know, just some pe- someone younger than us, and uh, our life can just turn. And of course, we don't know when that's going to happen. We know it will happen in one version or another for all of us, right? Nobody's exempt from insecurity, just even on the level of the body, let alone all these other exposures that just comes with human existence. So even though people often take up mindfulness meditation as a stress reduction technique, it's really here, this awakening process is really here to help us live in alignment with the truth of insecurity, truth of vulnerability. It really teaches us how to be a human being when we're not in control. So when we get this more subtle stuff, it might find like a sadness that doesn't make sense because there's nothing terrible happening in my life. Why is there this such real poignant sadness? Or it might feel like a real electric, uneasy, restless feeling. Or it might feel like a kind of a numb, dead, frozen, heavy feeling. Whatever it is, It's the next thing arising in the moment. So it's just the next thing that mindfulness connects with. Oh, this is being felt. This is being known. And because we're training the heart to trust, whatever shows up in our experience is worthy of this kind and balanced and intimate presence. Oh, I didn't ask for this. Nobody asked for it. But it's here. This experience is here. This emotional experience, this physical experience, this cognitive experience, it's here. So a wise practitioner always says, yes, this is how it is now. And like I said at the beginning, subtle is more significant than growth. So when something subtle is there, get interested. Oh, this is also being felt. This is also being known. Well, can I be aware of this? Can I give this permission to come and go to be what it is? Oh, yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, thanks for getting us going, Ruth. Other thoughts that come to mind, what you've been learning or questions that are emerging, challenges that are showing up in your practice? I feel like that's a control technique too. Like, does, is that contaminated or affected by that deep habit of wanting to control? Mm. Of course, it. like all of our patterns are going to infect our Dharma practice, our meditation practice. So you're going to catch. So if you're, if you're ten, like your temperament is someone to kind of hold back, then that's going to affect how you meditate. Or if you're kind of a leaning in type A person, that's going to, those qualities are going to infect your meditation practice. So we should just presume that whatever personality tendencies we have are going to show up in how we practice. And then we'll catch them. And it will almost, you know, bring a serene smile. Oh, oh, there you go again. You know, trying to control this. Because when we, see, when we know that it's going to happen, we can catch it more. And one uh, sort of thing we can understand that, as I described at the beginning of the class tonight, life is really ultimately wild. It's really wild. And it seems like it's orderly because we're constantly projecting our cognitive meaning, like what we think is happening, on our life. But like you said so well, Sarah, it's stressful <laughs> to always, but it doesn't mean that it hasn't helped you in life, right? In moments, we really need to sort of, you know, project and try to control and try to explain things and but it's not a long-term strategy. It's exhausting, right? So ultimately we want to learn more how to not control things, but how to ride, how to move with things. Like uh, I had a friend when I taught elementary school in uh, Oakland, California, this is back in the eighties. And uh, one of my, another teacher in the school and a good friend of mine was the, I think three time, women's Bronco champ, uh, national champ, riding horses, you know, at rodeos. And, uh, and we, we talked and just about how that, how you do that. I mean, I, I don't really ride horses, so I don't know too much about it, but just like, you're not going to beat the horse. You're not going to be able to control. The horse is so much stronger than you, you know? So staying on the horse is all about not struggling, not controlling but just coming into sync with the activity of the horse, right? Not fighting it. And there's, there's some, I mean, there are a lot of these kind, kinds of metaphors about how to be in life. And this means coming like how to make peace with our own conditioning. Cause sometimes we think a spiritual practice is like perfecting my personality, perfecting the world, perfecting my body, perf you know, and boy, is that a miserable trip, you know, this, this sort of cult of perfection. How, many, how much suffering we've caused ourselves and other people because we were addicted to some idea of perfection. So it's really about more embodying the reality of having this personality, living in this messy, imperfect world, having a physical body that ages and is by no, you know, description perfect, right? How to be really kind and skillful and intimate with the reality of nature, of life, body, mind, wider world. And so we're going to start catching. Uh, I've been talking about this at some of the other classes I've been teaching, you know, where we tend to swing back and forth between domination, trying to dominate life, and then giving up and being helpless. And that's all we know. It's like we try to dominate until we get so frustrated and burnt out. And then we somehow think the identity of being helpless and giving up is like a skillful way to live a life. It isn't. But nor is it skillful to think that somehow I can dominate reality 
and have safety in that way. And real spiritual practice comes when we give up on both of those extremes of somehow any version of helplessness is going to be functional or useful and any version of control ultimately is going to be functional or useful. And that's really, it's a lot of humility, like, well, what is neither of those? And, you know, we have words, like I've been saying in the class, intimacy without attachment. Being really there in each moment, whatever life is delivering in that moment, internal experience and outside experience. Intimacy, but not attachment. That means we're intimate, we're engaged, we're doing, like as a parent, some of you are public parents, you're there, it's like, doesn't make sense to not show up when you've got kids, especially young kids, right? Showing up, but not attached, not expecting to be a perfect parent, but not giving up on the project just because it's impossible to be a good parent. It's like really having that value of non-harming, which is big in, in Buddhist Buddhism, this, this deep resonant value of non-harming. But I'm sure you've noticed, it's impossible to be a human being without causing harm. Even if we're vegans, and even if we're really careful, we're complicit in subtle and not so subtle ways and so much harm. But it's still a very beautiful value to live with, to like give our heart to this non-harming, even though we're gonna fail at it. Because it isn't about perfection, it's about, it's a beautiful value to commit to, even though we'll never be perfect at it. And that really speaks to this, you know, like um, this commitment to be intimate and discovering non-attachment in the intimacy, in the exposure of being a human being. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing. Thank you. Oh, we're, we just have a few minutes left and um, there is a handout for week six and it's really about integrating the practice in daily life. And uh, yeah, I just want to mention a couple of things because, it, you know, in a way you're this class maybe for especially those who are completely new to the practice, it's been what's kind of held your interest together and now it's ending. And you're going to have to find other ways to keep the interest going. So please, like Kyle mentioned, check out the calendar, see what kind of programs might make sense. There's a Sunday morning program that I teach. Shelley Graff, one of the other main teachers, teaches every Wednesday night. Those are kind of two of the anchoring programs. But there are many other, including now several practice check-ins each week. Um, I do Tuesday at 12 noon. Shelly does 9 a.m. on Thursday. There's a Saturday one once a month and a few others as well where you can ask questions and have usually smaller groups um, to connect with the teacher. But mostly you're going to be on your own. And as I mentioned in one of the earlier classes, you know, the general vibe of our culture is in the direction of distraction and superficiality. And we don't feel good in life, so we use pleasant sense experience to kind of massage and keep us going, right? So something sweet from the fridge or something entertaining on the TV or this, and it kind of gets us through life seeking one sense experience to make life worth it, and then another, and then another. And you know what that's a recipe for? Real, I think, ultimate despair because it's like we miss our life. So it's really important that over time, we find something that really resonates in our heart as, you know, for lack of a better word, feels like a real path, a trustworthy path, spiritual path. And to find friends who are interested so that we're not alone on that path. And one of the hardest things you're going to find is how to keep the path in mind. And you might come across a particular little pithy phrase or teaching that really resonates and it will really work for you for a while. And then it's like those words don't really mean much to you anymore. It's like you repeat a phrase or a word too long and it loses its meaning. 
And so just be aware you have to like what actually brings you back to the value of the practice that you've actually discovered in your own life. You have to keep renewing it. It's going to have to be real. Can't be forced. So this is your first task actually. It's like, how are you going to keep the practice in mind? What is the pithy teaching that really resonates with you? Like I've said this several times during the course, intimacy, the marriage, the coming together of intimacy and non-attachment. That might be really kind of impactful for a while, but then you're going to have to find your own phrase or discover another pointing out instruction, whatever that might be to keep you going. So just keep that in mind. How do you come back to what's most important? Because the big enemy is forgetfulness and superficiality, where we actually, you know, live a life of postponement. I know this isn't that important. I'll get to the important stuff later, right? But I really want to see this show. And, and I'm not against TV or movies, you know, but we, we tend to like postpone what is actually we know in our heart is of real value. So how are you going to keep that in mind? And this is where community can come in, whether it's common ground, but there are several really good Buddhist meditation centers in the Twin Cities, not just common ground. So find one that's convenient to you, check it out. Like anything, you're going to have to see what really feels right and also what's convenient from given where you live. These days, of course, it doesn't matter. Like Sarah from Rhode Island and <laughs> probably a few, I, I think there are a few others of you who are way out of town. And there are some other instructions in that week six handout about just integrating it, uh, the practice in your daily life. So you might want to track down the handouts. I think I sent it in today's email and then just print that up so you can read it through and choose a couple. I think there are five suggestions. Choose one or two to take up. It will be fun. They're kind of fun suggestions of bringing the practice outside of your formal sitting time, whatever that is, most days of the week, but also just other ways to practice with the rest of the day. And I really enjoyed in the strange world where we're online together, getting to know you as best we can. And I hope to run into you actually in real life someday, maybe at the center, maybe somewhere else. And I wish you well in your practice. And as Kyle said, Never be shy about reaching out to the center. And we also on the website, you can sign up for practice meetings with Shelley or with me, one-on-one -on -one practice meetings, as well as the small group practice check-ins where you have time to ask questions. So take care, everybody. Hope to see you down the road.